Thank you. I want to thank you for having me uh, come here this evening and uh, spend a little time with you uh, and, and teach you a little bit about reflux, something that affects uh, a lot of us. And I'd like to start by saying at Exeter Hospital, we're very happy to have just been awarded uh, this designation of being uh, Endoscopy Center of Excellence, uh, being only one of two hospitals in this state uh, that has been able uh, to have this designation. What I'd like to discuss today is what is GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. We're going to talk about what the symptoms are, what kind of signs that you may experience, how do, we tr how do we diagnose it and make sure it's not something more concerning? And what are the treatment options that are available? GERD is reflux or backflow of gastric juice into the esophagus from the stomach. 20% of Americans experience GERD symptoms at least once per week. Frequency varies considerably among different ethnic groups. At the bottom of the esophagus, there is a two to four centimeter region. This is the barrier or the protective nature that our esophagus has from the acid in the stomach. Folks with reflux tend to have a lower esophageal sphincter pressure that is lower than it should be, which causes reflux to come or acid to come up from the stomach into the esophagus. Everyone will have brief episodes of reflux throughout the day, normally. It's when these episodes become more frequent and are associated with true indigestion symptoms and changes the quality of our lives is when it becomes a significant issue. There are transient lower esophageal sphincter uh, changes that we all undergo throughout the day. But in patients that have reflux, these tend to be more prevalent and more significant throughout the day. This is a schematic of the feeding tube where the food comes down the esophagus. And here is our stomach. And then there's an opening here called the pylorus. And this goes into our small bowel. Right here we see the diaphragm and there's a pinch here in the diaphragm that helps where the lower esophageal sphincter is to keep acid from coming up into the esophagus. A lot of you have heard about a hiatal hernia. You may have one, you may know a friend that has one. Um, it's not uncommon. If the stomach is here and the diaphragm is here, you can see that part of the stomach comes above the diaphragm into the chest area. And this itself can predispose to worsening reflux because of the nature of the acid coming up above the diaphragm and sitting here in the esophagus. Some people feel like this is what their reflux is on a regular basis. So this is an issue that uh, is very concerning to people. Heartburn is the wastebasket term of a sensation. Uh, the best way to put it is a feeling of burning or a sensation that comes up from um, in the belly area up towards the chest. But it's interesting because I'll talk to people and ask them if they have reflux and then they'll say no, but they'll say they have heartburn. <laughs> so it, everyone has their own definition of what they're experiencing. And that's why when I see patients in the office, I can't just ask if they have heartburn or if they have reflux. I usually like to ask them what they're experiencing because every person I see has something different that they are actually feeling. And that's very important. This is a whole list of what potential symptoms may be for indigestion. You've heard of heartburn. There can be uh, uh, folks that have chest pain. Um, and chest pain, the most important thing is I, I tell all of my patients that see me to see if their chest pain is from heartburn, if they've had a cardiac workup. 
because the most important thing is to make sure that the heart is okay before contemplating whether or not this is a gastrointestinal issue. Sore throat, hoarseness, people that are frequently clearing their throat, coughing, especially at night when lying down. You can think of that schematic where um, the uh, pressure is, gravity is working against you. You're lying uh, down in bed at night and the acid is coming into the esophagus due to that lower esophageal sphincter pressure being low. Dentists sometimes make the diagnosis for us and let us know that people have erosions and dental damage uh, from acid coming up into the esophagus and the mouth. There could be a globus sensation where there may not be anything in your, the back of your throat, but you feel right now like you're swallowing and something's in the back of the throat, and that's called globus. That may be your only symptom of or sign of reflux. Water brash and that's a regurgitation of excessive saliva in your mouth, as well as regurgitation of food and liquids. Now this is a very busy slide, but GERD is a condition which develops when the reflux of gastric content causes troublesome symptoms. As I mentioned, we all have periodic episodes where there is acid coming up into the esophagus, but it's when that acid over a long period of time is could be causing damage in the esophagus and worsening symptoms. The way I break this down is esophageal and then extra esophageal. So there can be manifestations in the esophagus itself as well as from other parts of the body. Other parts of the body being, we think of people that have a chronic cough. Could it be from the lungs? Could it be from reflux? We have to pursue both avenues, as well as laryngitis. Many people will see the ear, nose, and throat specialist and have a specialized uh, procedure where they look in the back, look at the vocal cords, and they can see in the posterior pharynx that there is signs of pharyngeal reflux, as well as in the mouth with dental uh, erosions or uh, uh, enamel uh, damage from reflux. The one that is really important for us as gastroenterologists is the esophageal manifestations. There are a few things that we need to think about when people have reflux. Not reflux occasionally, reflux on a regular basis, at least two, three, four times a week. Uh, we have to make sure that there isn't anything going on in the esophagus. Uh, and that's very important to know that there could be acid coming up into the esophagus causing inflammation which is known as esophagitis. There could be acid that comes up from the stomach and sits in the esophagus and over the years can cause narrowing in the esophagus and that narrowing is called a stricture and sometimes you might need a procedure to stretch the esophagus to open up that area so that the swallowing is better for you. There's an entity called Barrett's esophagus that we'll spend a little time on this evening. And that's very important to know because that can be a, a pre... So when you have acid for years, without looking into the esophagus, we don't know if the acid has changed the lining of the esophagus. And that change in the lining is called Barrett's esophagus. And that's important to know if you have that, because if you do, we have to monitor you every few years to make sure that that Barrett's doesn't change into a precancerous condition. That precancerous condition could be called dysplasia. So we monitor you very closely. And that dysplasia could, undiagnosed and untreated, may even, the dysplasia may turn into an adenocarcinoma, which is an esophageal cancer. But we don't want it to get it to that point. We want to, when you're having the reflux and it's continuous and it's becoming bothersome, we want to look in at that point to, to prevent any complications. From acid in the stomach coming into the esophagus, sitting there for a prolonged period of time, it can cause inflammation called the esophagitis. And this is uh, a uh, classification 
where we see the esophagus here and there's some area of inflammation. And as we go from A to D, the severity of the inflammation becomes more severe. When we see here, this grade D is a full circumference of the esophagus. And people are having very significant reflux on a daily basis. This area here is that inflammation. This is normal mucosa of the esophagus. And this reddish area here is inflamed tissue. So we like to biopsy this area and prove with a pathologist that it is inflammation and esophagitis because at that point we need to put you on medication to treat that inflammation and get rid of that before it becomes a complication of reflux, which would be this next diagram here. This area here, if you see the circumference here, it's a normal circumference, but here the circumference is very narrow. So this is an esophageal stricture, which is a narrowing in the esophagus from chronic reflux. This right here is normal esophageal mucosa. And this area here is what we call salmon-colored mucosa. And this salmon-colored mucosa you might hear about is what tips us off to take biopsies to look for a change in the esophagus called Barrett's. Now, if we don't see this uh, uh, sign, which can be a precursor to dysplasia or precancer, we may miss this next lesion, which none of us want to see, which is an adenocarcinoma or a cancer in the esophagus. You may have symptoms of reflux, and when we look into the esophagus, there isn't any signs of inflammation, scarring, redness, and that is called NERD, which is non-erosive reflux disease. And we may think that that might be a hypersensitivity in our esophagus, which causes true reflux symptoms. And the patient is actually really feeling those reflux symptoms. But when we look in, there isn't damage from necessarily acid exposure in the esophagus. 70% of patients who have an endoscopy because of GERD have no signs of any of those bad pictures I was showing with the inflammation and the scarring. So it's really 30% of the population that's having reflux that we're actually seeing damage in the esophagus from that chronic heartburn. This is a good question. What causes reflux? Well, it's a major problem in the country with the obesity epidemic. People are smoking. People are eating more than they should be. Uh, everything now is bigger is better, super size. Not necessarily, especially when it comes to reflux. And this is, this is actually what's going on over time. The obesity epidemic is really impacting reflux and symptoms for many Americans across the country. This is a nice table which really breaks down different foods as well as medications that people may be on that could cause reflux. And you may look at the left side and say, well, what can I eat or drink? It's all the stuff I like. Um, but everything in moderation. I think it's OK to have uh, a lot of these foods or, or beverages. But it's when excess takes into place and you're having symptoms with those uh, certain uh, uh, foods or drinks that I would recommend uh, stopping them. Uh, but if, if you're drinking in moderation, if you're having a healthy diet, then that's going to benefit you immensely when it uh, comes down to uh, getting relief from heartburn symptoms. The list that I always go over in the office with my patients are alcoholic beverages, carbonated beverages, citrus fruit drinks, chocolate, coffee, fatty foods, peppermint, spicy foods, and tomato products. And on the right-hand side, some medications that are over-the-counter even, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can cause reflux. Ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil, Aleve. Nicotine is a big one. People that smoke, I recommend that they stop smoking 
and they usually get improvement in their reflux symptoms from quitting tobacco. And then some of these other medications, anticholinergics, uh, nitrates, people that have uh, uh, issues with their heart may be on nitrates, or calcium channel blockers for blood pressure uh, monitoring. I'm not advocating that we stop the medications, uh, but on the right-hand side, just keep in mind that caffeine, nicotine, and anti-inflammatories are ones that we don't need to be using as much as most people are, and that could uh, help with reflux symptoms. So when someone comes into the office with reflux, I have this algorithm in my own mind where I go over what they tell me they're feeling and what I initially do is try changing their lifestyle. If they're overweight and they're not exercising, we start working on that. We go over an anti-reflux diet, which is refraining from a lot of the substances I just recommended uh, that we refrain from. And then we also look at medications. And I usually like to use the least potent medications possible up front. And if we need to use more aggressive medications that I have many people on indefinitely, we can do that. But it's when we change the lifestyle, when we start medications and symptoms persist, that you need to either tell your primary care to send you to the gastroenterologist or you contact one of us in the office to be evaluated. Because the next step is usually an endoscopy to look for some of those findings that I showed in that picture of four different things that could be uh, a or complication from chronic reflux that you wouldn't know that you had unless we looked in. And then we're going to go over some other testing that's a little bit, uh, the endoscopy is usually the first step that we do, but then we have other modalities that we can do if things continue to progress and we don't have a cause after we look in. If the history is typical for uncomplicated reflux, as I mentioned, we start with lifestyle changes, and these are very important. As I mentioned, weight loss. People will have reflux when they're lying down at night. They may cough a lot. They may be up in, with indigestion symptoms. And the first thing I ask them to do is to sleep on a couple of pillows. Some people have such severe reflux at night that they actually have to raise the head of the bed on cinder blocks. And that also helps. As you can think, it, your gravity is working in your favor if you're lifting the head of the bed either with cinder blocks or uh, your head on a few pillows instead of being recumbent where that acid can come through that lower esophageal sphincter and sit in the esophagus all night and keep you up and very uncomfortable. Wearing loose fitting clothes is very important. Avoiding the precipitating agents that we mentioned. A lot of people have bedtime snacks, and that's the worst thing you can do. Uh, I recommend at least three hours after eating before you lie down so that we can let the digestive process take place. Avoiding cigarettes, alcohol, and drugs that we mentioned that could lower that lower esophageal sphincter. And that's the big thing. You may ask, well, why can't I have chocolate or why can't I have peppermint? And what happens is those agents decrease that area at the bottom of the esophagus called the lower esophageal sphincter. So that should have a certain pressure. And if you're eating or drinking things that can cause that pressure to be looser, more reflux is going to come up into the esophagus and aggravate symptoms. Regardless of heartburn, there are a few things that when I hear necessitate a, a, a workup with an upper endoscopy. An upper endoscopy is where you come to the endoscopy center and you are given medication uh, to sedate uh, and most people fall asleep. And what we do is we use a very thin scope that we put into the, the feeding tube, the esophagus or the food tube, and we go into the bottom of the esophagus, look for changes, look in the stomach, and also the first part of the small bowel. And a few things that really prompt a workup with an endoscopy, besides reflux 
that doesn't improve with medication and lifestyle changes is if you're having difficulty swallowing. So if food is getting stuck, then, or you're having food get caught up and it's sticking and it's not going down and you're having to force food up, then that's, that's a red flag that you should have an endoscopy because there could be a narrowing or a ring, a stricture in the esophagus that would need to be stretched. Another reason to have an endoscopy would be for a term called odynophagia. And odynophagia is when you have pain when you swallow. And that could be a sign that there could be inflammation in the esophagus called esophagitis. That could be from reflux, or that could actually even be from a viral infection. And um, there are different infections that can affect the esophagus. And the only way we know that is to look in and take biopsies. If someone is having any gastrointestinal bleeding, whether it's vomiting black, vomiting red, or having any signs of rectal bleeding that are black or red, then we normally start with an endoscopy and even a colonoscopy. But GI bleeding is a reason for doing an endoscopy, uh, especially if you're vomiting blood. There may be imaging modalities that have been done that have shown abnormalities. And normally what we have to do is using those modalities, we get to that area that there's concern and we take biopsies or try treatment. So the upper endoscopy is not only diagnostic, but it's also therapeutic in the sense that if we find something, we can diagnose it, take biopsies, but potentially also fix the problem. When food is getting stuck called dysphagia, we could stretch that narrowing so that you symptomatically can feel better and not have to be at dinner choking on food because we have to get to the bottom of that and find out if there is an underlying issue that's more concerning. We've spent a little time on Barrett's and that's very important. Chronic reflux. I tell my patients if they've had reflux for five, ten years, you've never had an endoscopy, then we need to do an endoscopy to get to the bottom of the esophagus and take biopsies for Barrett's. And that can only be made with biopsies. Um, you won't feel anything different. You may feel reflux, you may not feel reflux. So it's very important, anyone who's had reflux for five to 10 years and has never had an endoscopy, then that's something that we should do to make sure there's no Barrett's. We may treat you for reflux with over-the-counter medications. You might not get better. We may do an endoscopy. We may not find anything. So now what do we do? Well, there's also a test that we can do called a manometry test. And this test puts a small catheter into the esophagus through the nose, and we can measure the lower esophageal sphincter at the bottom of the esophagus and determine what the millimeters of mercury or the pressure is. Is it high? Is it low? And based on how, when we put the catheter in, we have patients swallow 20, 30 times sequentially, and we get these readings, uh, manometry readings, and they can tell us what the muscle of the esophagus is actually doing. Is it contracting appropriately? Are the pressures at the bottom of the esophagus too high? where the esophagus is an emptying. So that's another modality that we can do called manometry testing. And this right here is the swallowing mechanism. And this is what you want to see when you initiate a swallow, the peristalsis or the wave that goes through the, uh, the esophagus. You want to see it come down nicely like this. And at the lower esophageal sphincter, you don't want it to be too low, too high, and these, these are how we can determine if there is a problem swallowing or if they're uh, from a motility problem. Um, because swallowing may not just be from, swallowing problems might not be just from a narrowing or stricture that needs to be stretched. It may not be from chronic heartburn. It could be from a muscle problem and how the esophagus is actually contracting. So this is another modality that we can use to rule that out because treatment options would be different. When we do an upper endoscopy, 
we can also see how much acid is in the esophagus when patients are experiencing what they call reflux or their equivalent of what heartburn is. So we do an endoscopy and two-thirds down into the esophagus, after we do the endoscopy, two-thirds down into the esophagus, we place a small device, a capsule. And this capsule is called a Bravo capsule. And this is a really neat test. Um, not too long ago, as many of you may remember, um, or some of you may remember, uh, I should say, um, uh, people would come in for pH testing. They would have reflux symptoms. And this was, this was very um, uh, invasive. Uh, have to put in a tube through your nose. It would be at the bottom of the esophagus. Uh, uh, and people would go about their, their life and, and be with this uncomfortable tube um, in their nose, in their, in their esophagus. And they would be measuring how much acid is in the esophagus. Well, nowadays, we don't have to do any of that. This capsule is a wireless uh, capsule, no catheters. It sticks onto the into the esophagus where we deploy it. And you're connected to this little device that's really the size of a, of a large uh, cell phone. Um, and this captures all of the recordings as far as the acid is concerned. So this is a tracing that we get. You go home and for 48 hours, you are recording when you're having reflux. And you have a journal. And if you're having reflux when you lie down at night, then you're reporting that in your journal and also pressing the button on the device so that when the physician looks over all of the data, we can look at this tracing. This breaks it down to when you're supine so this person was lying down these two nights to sleep. So this gray area here is when they were sleeping. Now the pH, when it's less than four, you're dealing with a very acidic environment. So we can actually know if someone, when they're sleeping, is having reflux where the acid or the pH is dropping before, uh, below four. We can see if your acid reflux is after meals, and we can monitor it that way. And what we do is we tally up all the information, we look at your journal, we look at this tracing here, and we see when this person reported that they were having symptoms, do we see a significant drop in pH? And right here we do. And this will help to determine whether or not what you're feeling from reflux is from an acidic component. There is also another type of testing that can be done at the same time in some of the tertiary uh, academic centers, and we do do this at uh, Exeter Hospital, uh, where you can see if the content that's coming up into the esophagus is something other than acid. And this is called an impedance monitor. And this is the catheter itself. So it's important to know if there's acid that you're truly feeling below P pH of 4. But if there isn't and you're truly feeling your symptoms, then we got to find out is it something else that's not acidic that could be causing that. And that's why what we call this impedance catheter is important to determine what could be causing the symptoms for you. So the combined pH and impedance is what we can do at Exeter Hospital. You might be asking yourself, well, there's a lot of testing going on here. We may not need to do any of this on you. It's if we've tried medication, we've tried lifestyle changes, we've done an endoscopy, and we still can't find what's going on, then these are the other modalities that we're looking at to help relieve some of your symptoms. And diagnosing the problem and finding out what the underlying root to the problem is, is really the best way uh, to go about it. And that's why we're doing all this testing in some folks. Switching gears now, you have heartburn, what do you do for it? You've tried changing your lifestyle. You've tried losing weight. You're staying away from all of the right agents. What do you do now? As I mentioned, I think the best way to go about it is every medication we take has a potential side effect. So I always start off with over-the-counter medications that are less potent. 
good old Tums, Alka-Seltzer, things that we all know have worked over the years. These are really good if your heartburn is only maybe once, twice a week. So things that we can think about are Tums, Milk of Magnesia, Gaviscon, Alka-Seltzer, Maalox, Mylanta, or Rolades. These can temporarily relieve heartburn. This is taking a Tums after some indigestion with a large meal. This is the perfect type of agent you can use, which is over the counter. You don't need a prescription. It may not be enough. So there are other over the counter medications that we can try, and these are called H2 blockers. We have Zantac or Pepsid, and these are medications that really work within 20 minutes and you can get it for fast relief. The issue with the H2 blockers is that if you have those images I show with inflammation and esophagitis and, and complications already of reflux, to treat those, the esophagus that has that inflammation, these agents may not be the best choice. Another point with the H2 blockers that many people are on is that the longer you're on them, they may not be working as effectively as they once did months or years earlier. Prokinetic agents. In the past, Reglan was used. I, don't use, I do not recommend Reglan or, or promotility agents for reflux. There are a lot of side effects that can come with these medications. Cisapride is one that was taken off the market, and that was due to cardiac arrhythmias. Baclofen, a muscle relaxer, has also been shown to decrease those lower esophageal uh, sphincter pressure, uh, the, the uh, bottom of the esophagus, when we were talking about the pressures, uh, baclofen can affect those, that lower esophageal pressure so that reflux can improve. Um, but overall, as a category, I don't recommend going to these medications. Sucrophate is a medication that can be in pill form or in liquid form. Some people that have esophagitis or, re or inflammation in the esophagus may do well with a liquid solution that coats the esophagus and soothes the, the symptoms of the indigestion or the heartburn. So I do use uh, sucrophate at times uh, for patients that, that may need it. This is really the gold standard, a PPI, proton pump inhibitors. Um, it feels like everybody is on this. It, it must be in the water. You come into the hospital and we're always looking at people who are going home and uh, uh, we always like to make sure that um, if you weren't on one coming into the hospital, that if you're not having symptoms, there's no need for you to go home on it. Um, and that's very important because it feels like, it seems like everybody is on one. Um, but I do think if you've tried over-the-counter medications and the reflux is on a more regular basis, especially if you have esophagitis or inflammation in the esophagus. These are the best agents to use. Um, two of them are over the counter now. We have Amiprazole or Prilosec, and now Isomiprazole and Nexium, the purple pill, it, that is over the counter. But generally these uh, medications, what we call the PPIs, are prescription. They're the most effective medication that's out there to treat reflux. In patients that have esophagitis or inflammation in the esophagus, um, their healing rates of treating those uh, abnormalities 80 to 100 percent within three months. The H2 blockers over-the-counter medications that we mentioned up to this point don't have that efficacy or are not as good to do that. Um, maintenance therapy, however, is needed in many people. And like I said, I don't like to have people on medication unless they need to be on it. But some of my patients are on them two times a day indefinitely. And we're going to talk about the side effect profile. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of debate on if that's a good idea or isn't it a good idea. So I, I will spend a minute talking about that. But, but people do, regardless, have to be on this medication sometimes indefinitely so that they can have relief of their symptoms and treatment for some of the things that we find in the endoscopy. Not only is it important to be on the right medication, but are you taking the medication correctly? And this is, this is uh, surprising, but uh, a lot of primary care physicians um, may not tell you when to take it. 
Um, this is just shows some people say before food, some people say after food, some people don't mention it at all or don't think it's an issue. It, it absolutely is an issue. There are hydrogen pumps in the stomach and the hydrogen pumps are what generate the acid. So the best time to take the medication is half an hour before a meal. So I always tell people to take a proton pump inhibitor a half an hour before breakfast. And by the time you eat breakfast, those hydrogen pumps have really been shut down to a degree where that reflux will not be as significant. This is a very hot topic nowadays. Probably several times a day I'll hear patients talk about long-term uh, uh, use of proton pump inhibitors. And like I mentioned, everybody is on these. So there, there are studies that show thousands of patients throughout the country who have been on, on these medications for years. Small percentage of these patients in the studies, and I'm talking super small percentage, um, have had different things happen. An infection in the stool called Clostridium difficile or C. diff. They've had aspiration pneumonia, a hip fracture. You can have polyps in the stomach, which are benign, but nonetheless are a result of the proton pump inhibitor, and those are called fundic gland polyps. There can be low levels of magnesium and also decreased effect of Plavix. Many people are on Plavix for cardiac disease. So the one medication of the PPIs that are safe is a medication called pantoprazole or Protonix. But this is, a, this is something that is really important to know. Out of all those patients in the studies, there isn't adequate evidence though to mandate that we do any of these things. Checking bone density studies, calcium supplementation, H. pylori screening. However, I always tell my patients, if you're over 50, if you're gonna be on proton pump inhibitors indefinitely, the best thing that I recommend is a calcium supplement going forward. And I do, at a, at bone density studies, that is still all very important. Osteoporosis screening, um, but with the proton pump inhibitors, the benefit that you get from being on one far outweighs these theoretically very low possibilities of any of these. But the one thing that is at the top of my list is that it can affect bone absorption, it can cause hip fractures in elderly uh, patients, uh, especially less mobile patients. So I always recommend a calcium supplement every day if you're on a proton pump inhibitor. Why won't these medications work? Compliance, you're not taking them. A proton pump inhibitor is not like an H2 blocker or Tums. You can't just grab it out of your uh, purse or your pocket and say, I have reflux now, I'm going to take this pill and it's going to go away. A proton pump inhibitor is something that has to be taken every day. It works um, on the release of the medication itself. It has to be in your system every day so that around the clock you have medication in your system. So not taking it routinely and just taking a proton pump inhibitor when you have reflux, I can pretty much guarantee it's not going to help you because it has to be in the system. Improper dosing, because not, not on your end, but someone that gave you the medication might not have told you exactly how to take it. So that's important. It may not be working because you haven't been told how to take it properly. So half an hour before breakfast is the best way to take it. Um, there could be visceral hypersensitivity, so you may not see any damage in the esophagus, but you may feel symptoms because the esophagus itself is so sensitive uh, to even the smallest amount of acid that people have symptoms regardless of medication. There could be concomitant irritable bowel syndrome symptoms that sometimes muddy the water, um, and there are medications to treat irritable bowel syndrome, uh, but that sometimes uh, is seen with patients that have uh, uh, significant reflux. Um, delayed gastric emptying, diabetics, patients on certain medications, um, uh, they can have what we call gastroparesis, which is an inability of the stomach to properly empty. So that picture I showed of the stomach, if you're not emptying the stomach, the stomach is full, it's coming up into it, that area where the diaphragm is and coming up into the esophagus. So um, 
it, it may be that there's something else causing the reflux. So it's very important. Sometimes patients need to get a gastric emptying study to see if their motility through the stomach is adequate. As well as another entity called eosinophilic esophagitis. And you may have reflux, but not have any damage such as inflammation um, or scarring or narrowing, but you may have an entity that we call for short EOE. And, and this is something that we only know that you potentially could have if you have difficulty swallowing. And anybody that comes in with difficulty swallowing for me, I'm looking in the esophagus to see if there's anything to stretch, but even if there isn't anything to stretch, I'm still taking biopsies at the bottom of the esophagus and the middle of the esophagus for this entity. And EOE is seen in patients that have allergies to certain foods, asthma, um, and this is something that can cause difficulty swallowing. And without doing an endoscopy and having the gastroenterologist specifically biopsy for this entity, the diagnosis won't be made. So that's also something, if you have reflux and you have difficulty swallowing, or that word we call dysphagia, where food is getting stuck, then you need to see a gastroenterologist so we can look for this entity. To summarize, heartburn is something that a lot of us get, sometimes infrequently, sometimes frequently. And I think the best take home to take from this lecture tonight is that if you are having regular symptoms of reflux, that I want you to do something. Talk to your primary care physician, look at the stuff that's in your lifestyle. Do you need to refrain from certain agents? Do you need to stay away from certain medications over the counter like anti-inflammatories? And see if over-the-counter medications like Tums or H2 blockers aren't working, then the next step is to see the, see the primary care uh, uh, doctor, get a referral to see us in the office, and we can talk more about symptoms. Because the, ne the next step after you've done your part may be that we need to look in for particular things that could be going on that you don't know you may have unless we look for it. Um, Medication-wise, the proton pump inhibitors are the best as far as chronic maintenance of heartburn symptoms. As I mentioned, I, I do not like Reglan for reflux. I don't think it's an appropriate use of this medication uh, because of the possible side effects. Um, and the goal of therapy, always use the lowest dose to control the symptoms. I don't think that we need to be on proton pump inhibitors two times a day if we can be on a small dose once a day. Lifestyle changes, as I, I mentioned, is very important. And it's when we tried everything, we've done all the workup, and you're still having symptoms despite being on maximum proton pump inhibitor therapy, is when we then say, you need to see one of our colleagues across the hall in the general surgery department. Because at that point, we need to talk about surgical options. And people that have reflux could have a hiatal hernia that we diagnose on the upper endoscopy. And the hiatal hernia is the part of the stomach coming up into the chest area above the diaphragm. So seeing the surgeon, they can do a procedure where they bring the esophagus back down below the diaphragm and wrap the top part of the stomach right where that diaphragm is so that it doesn't go back up. And fixing the, fixing the hiatal hernia and doing that wrap is called a Nissen fundoplication where, they, where they're tying or wrapping the stomach in that area so the reflux isn't as prevalent. And Probably upwards of 90% of patients, if they're at that point, that go and undergo the surgery. This is a surgery that you're in the hospital overnight. You're probably going to be on a special diet for 72 hours, liquids only. After that, for about a week or so, you may be on purees, uh, puree type uh, diet. Um, but the recovery is within a week or two. People are back to what they're doing, swallowing fine. And this surgery, um, this wrap to fix the, uh, the issue of the reflux and the hiatal hernia is something that uh, is really reserved for worst case scenario. If we've done all of this diagnostic 
um, if we've done all of this diagnostic uh, uh, modalities and we, we've tried to find a, a source, we've ruled out things that are bad, we've tried you on medications and they're not, just not working, then what I do at that point is say, let's send you to one of the surgeons to have a discussion. Have a discussion with one of the surgeons regarding details of what the, what the surgery entails. Um, and then most people that do go ahead with that surgery, if they're the worst case scenario, do remarkably well. So uh, overall, reflux is a disease, re reflux is a symptom of, of potential complications that we won't know that you have unless we investigate for it. Uh, but it's something that you shouldn't be living with every day and just saying it's going to get better or you know, if it stays there, I'll talk to somebody. Like I mentioned, if you're having recurrent symptoms of reflux, you know, several times a week, um, and you're doing all the right things, then then uh, you need to come see us so that we can help you. It's a, it's a, it reflux is something that we can fix uh, if if we just know that you're having it, so we can look in and and get you on the right medication. Famotidine or Pepsid is an H H2 blocker that's purchased over the counter. If you are able to, to have symptom relief with that medication, I would stay on that medication. It's when people, after have, they've been on it for months to years, it, may, it just may not work as well as it used to. It, it's that type of medication where the longer you're on it, you may not have as much as a benefit. But I tell patients, if they can stay on that medication and not need a stronger one, I'm, I'm okay keeping you on that. But it's not over the counter, it's a prescription. You can, you can get those medications over the counter. Um, Zantac or ranitidine. Um, pep Ramidodine is what I'm taking. That's also called Pepsid, and that can be oh. over the counter. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, no problem. Next question. If the PPIs eliminate the, sy the symptoms, does that mean they're putting the problem at rest? That's an excellent question. Um, I usually ask my patients to, uh, for a, about two to four weeks, be on a proton pump inhibitor once a day. If the symptoms go away and you stop the medication and the symptoms don't come back, there may have been some inflammation in the GI tract that that medicine treated. And if you don't have symptoms return, then I wouldn't do anything else. It's when patients are on a proton pump inhibitor for a month, let's say, on average, and they're feeling much better, and they stop the medication. Within several days or within a week, their symptoms come right back. That's the first, that's the first step in the algorithm for me where I say, that's when we need to do something different. Because if you have self-limited inflammation and your symptoms are gone for good, that's a, a telltale sign that things are okay. It's when the symptoms return that at that point I would recommend an endoscopy um, because I would be looking for all of those things that we talked about tonight. But that's a very good question because if you have reflux and you go on a proton pump inhibitor for two to four weeks and your symptoms go away, then I think you're okay to just watch and make sure they don't come back. I have acid reflux and I periodically how do I know, oh, I have acid reflux and I periodically have episodes in which I have pain, discomfort, throwing up, etc. How do I know that this is acid reflux and not a heart attack? The first thing to do is, is see your primary care physician. Um, with any pain in the chest, I recommend that they, and, and if it hasn't been done, usually even in the GI office, I'll order it myself because cardiac disease, as I mentioned, um, it, chest pain can be from several things. And in my mind, heart is always number one. So I get an EKG and I send, I send you to the cardiologist to get a stress test. Um, so that's an excellent question. We're doing blood tests called troponin to make sure that there's no signs of any ischemia or blockages in the heart. We're doing an EKG and also a stress test. Then the second thing that can cause pain um, or uh, any of those symptoms 
is from reflux GI type symptoms. And at that point, I'm doing an endoscopy to look for all of the things that can possibly be um, uh, problems from chronic reflux. But heart is always the first thing that needs to be looked into. Yes? You guys are asking great questions tonight. Um, uh, the esophagus is normally squamous mucosa, squamous lining. The, a little bit lower in the GI tract is columnar lining. So it's what we call a metaplasia or a, a change from the, the usual mucosa to a different type of mucosa that's somewhere else in the GI tract. Now that in itself is Barrett's. So once you have it, you, you can't get rid of Barrett's. You'll always have Barrett's. And that's, the, that's usually the reaction that my, page, my, my patients have that same look um, because it's, it's unfortunate, you can't reverse it. But once you have Barrett's, what we do at that point is we put you on a proton pump inhibitor because that's why we say if you've had reflux for five to 10 years, we have to do the upper endoscopy to look for Barrett's. And if you have Barrett's, every three years, we're going to be doing an endoscopy to specifically take biopsies at the bottom of the esophagus to make sure there's no precancer called dysplasia. Is there an interaction with the PPIs with other medicines? Um, thyroid or blood pressure or anything anyone's taking? Usually, if people are on thyroid medication, I may even postpone that half an hour before breakfast to before dinner or before lunch, because I like to give it a couple hours away from medications from the, for the thyroid. Um, the only other big one is people that are on Plavix. The studies have shown that Plavix and the proton pump inhibitors, except for Protonix, can have an interaction where they make the Plavix not work as well. So I would never want to treat your reflux, but put you at risk for a heart attack or a blockage. So. If you're on Plavix, you should be on Protonix as well. One more question, okay? The uh, um, esophagus, when you have, uh, it, it's been damaged from the acid. I heard if you, they put something down in there, it burns the esophagus and changes the, the uh, type of cells that are in there. Is that true or not? You said it's, you don't do that. that. So when people have a change in the lining called Barrett's, what happens is every three years when we're monitoring for dysplasia or the precancer, we don't do anything with Barrett's except look every three years and treat you with a proton pump inhibitor. It's when the Barrett's turns into dysplasia or precancer. There's two types, low grade and high grade. That's the precursor to cancer. So if you have Barrett's, the chance of you getting esophageal cancer is probably 0.1 to 0.2% chance a year for a patient. So it's very, not everyone that has Barrett's will have esophageal cancer, but it's when the Barrett's turns into dysplasia that we do a procedure through an endoscopy procedure that's a, a catheter that we put into the esophagus and where the dysplasia or precancer is, we do a procedure called RFA, which is radio frequency ablation. And this catheter burns the area of precancer. And then what we do is every six months, we're looking again and taking biopsies because we know that that dysplasia left untreated or not burned off can turn into cancer. Uh, it's at low percentages, but now, if the Barrett's ever changes to dysplasia, we're doing the burning, which is radiofrequency ablation. So what you heard is correct. Well, thank you. And so I'm going to stick around for a few more minutes. Uh, I encourage more questions. Uh, thank you very much for having me.